In 1906, C.B. McDonald set out to build a Lynx course in America that would be comparable to the best of Great Britain and Ireland, and fulfill the previously untapped potential of golf in the United States. Along with Chief Engineer Seth Rayner, he spent several years fashioning his ideal layout along the bays and sandy nooks of eastern Long Island, finally unveiling the course in 1911 with a name as ambitious as the concept. What McDonald produced was the first golf course in the country designed to pose strategies and alternate routes of play. Some of his holes were near replicas and others were his own creations incorporating the best ideas. A bunker from one lynx, a green contour from another, but McDonald's audacious approach to golf architecture was not plagiarism, it was adulation. If you want to be the best, draw inspiration from the best. This is every hole at National Golf Links of America. With each hole, McDonald provides a variety of avenues from tee to green, always presenting the golfer a trade-off between risk and reward. That's clearly evident on the tee shot at the short par four first hole. The bold play is to challenge the hillside of bunkers along the left side to either reach the green from the tee or leave an unobstructed pitch shot. A drive down the center line or to the right will end up in the heart of the valley that gives this hole its name. But the next shot is blind over a bunker and hidden mounds. The multiple leveled green itself also demands tactical play. You might try to bounce it up and incline to certain pin locations, but for others, the best shot might be lofted in an attempt to let the ball settle down to tap in range. By every measure, this is no ordinary golf hole. Second is a short, drivable par four that affords the golfer more reward than risk. The tee shot is blind and uphill over tumultuous terrain to a hidden diagonal fairway. The direct line to the green is over the back left corner of an elaborate half-acre bunker based on the old Sahara bunker at Royal St. George's. A safer drive over the center of the bunker will find the deep fairway hollow on the right, and any tee shot aimed far right will have a similar fate. But even an aggressive drive that reaches the fringe or putting surface is no guaranteed birdie, as the enormous green slopes and undulates from front right to back left. With its diagonal fairway and cross bunker, an imposing domed hill hiding the green, the third was inspired by the notorious Alps Hole, the 17th at Prestwick in Scotland. The approach is again another blind shot except for those electing to play up the right as a three shot par four. When the wind is in the golfer's face, a small fairway on the crown of the hill may serve as a layup option. The large green has something of a backstop, but there are deep hidden bunkers short that must be cleared to reach the putting surface avoiding an even deeper bunker to the right. After finishing the hole, golfers tug the bell rope in the bell tower to signal the all clear. McDonald wanted to replicate the infamous par three Redan of North Berwick in Scotland, a green he described as a tilted table with its back left leg shortened. In surveying the land for purchase, he found the perfect landform for his masterpiece requiring earthwork only to carve out brutal bunkers front and rear. With a six foot drop from right to left, the canted diagonal green is nearly impossible to hit and hold. The best approach is a shot short and right to the high collar, allowing the ball to drift downward onto the green and toward the pin. In the past hundred years, countless versions of the Redan have been built in America. McDonald's design at National was the first in America and according to many, the best in the world. There are 10 bunkers in play off the tee, but the genius of McDonald's fifth hole is how he used fairway contours to make the tee shot uncomfortable. The crescent-shaped cross bunkers obscure the fairway landing area that expands significantly. Undulation makes this incredibly wide corridor harder to hold than it appears. It's also challenging for the longer hitters given the presence of a narrow, 80-yard long bunker that splits the fairway. The green, resting on a side slope, is best approached favoring the right side. Anything off the left will tumble down into a deep and narrow set of bunkers. The shortest hole on the course features one of the largest greens, an 11,000 square foot target reachable from the elevated tees with a short iron. But the green is a complex collection of three precise targets. The most prominent is a circular, saucer-like depression in the center. To its right and down a steep slope is a flat putting surface that is surrounded by a five foot deep bunker. 
The back left portion of the green is a terrace guarded by a false front and a back bunker. The National Short Hole is considered by many to be a classic McDonald original design, but in truth, it was inspired by the fifth hole at Royal West Norfolk in England, also known as Brancaster. Seventh hole is a rendition of the world-renowned road hole, the 17th at the old course at St. Andrews. Unlike the original, which required a tee shot over the rooftops of railroad sheds to reach a hidden fairway, the drive here must clear the crest of a hill as well as an elaborate collection of bunkers, and avoid a bunker in the middle of the fairway which doesn't exist at St. Andrews. The long, slender, diagonal green wider on the left is a close copy of St. Andrews, but is not nearly as steep on the right. Instead of an actual road along its back right flank, there's a long, deep bunker. What McDonald did replicate was the road hole bunker at front left, an eight foot deep circular chasm rimmed by a near vertical sod wall, a hazard every bit as treacherous as the original. Patterned after a now defunct hole at Leven Links in Scotland, the bottle hole offers a choice of bottleneck fairways. The fairway is split by a necklace of penal bunkers with the left side far tighter, but worth the risk because it's at the same elevation as the green. The right fairway is wider, but lower in elevation. The approach shot is slightly shorter, but uphill. Big hitters can aim straight down the center and carry all the trouble, but must deal with the principal's nose, a trio of bunkers at the 300 yard mark. From any angle, the approach must carry the green's deceptive false front and a pair of foreboding deep face bunkers. A miss long and left could result in a lucky rebound onto the green, but the escarpment just off the right collar must be avoided at all costs. At 540 yards, the ninth is National's longest hole and finishes farthest from the clubhouse. Nine is McDonald's tribute to yet another hole at the old course of St. Andrews, the par 5 14th, best known for its cross hazard called the Hell Bunker. National's far more expansive version is encountered off the tee and consists of church pews similar to those at Oakmont. Beyond these are deep cavities of sand and a center inverted bunker, a pad of sand that pops up on several holes at National. Approach shots must be accurate and hold the green as flanking bunkers and a lengthy rear runoff are formidable defenses. When the course was first staked out, this was intended to be the finishing hole, with the adjacent 10th hole serving as the opener. The old Shinnecock Inn, then set back from the ninth green, served as the temporary clubhouse. But in 1909, the inn burned to the ground, forcing the club to design and build the clubhouse that stands today on a bluff overlooking Peconic Bay. Another structure worth your attention is National's iconic windmill, positioned between the second and 16th holes. A rather ordinary water tower originally occupied the spot, but when club member Daniel Pomeroy suggested that a windmill would be a much more attractive structure, McDonald ordered it built, then left a bill for its construction in Pomeroy's locker. At the 10th, play turns back toward the clubhouse and into the prevailing wind. The hole, named Shinnecock, is the flattest on the course, with a tree line down the right separating it from neighboring Shinnecock Hills Golf Club. A cross bunker just 200 yards off the tee suggests the drive be played down the right side. Otherwise, the second shot is all carry over a left-hand field of bunkers and waste area rough. The green is huge, with a shelf comprising the back third of the putting surface. Bernard Darwin considered hole 10 to be one of McDonald's great original holes. The 11th challenges the golfer with another blind drive over the horizon to a wide sloping fairway, with a second shot over a ridge to a brilliantly configured green. As at the 8th, there's a principal's nose bunker complex 70 yards short of the putting surface. The crescent-shaped green has three distinct sections. The front left and back right sections are each a shelf three feet higher than the center. A bunker guards every section. This was the first double plateau green McDonald built, a feature he and Rayner would often incorporate on courses they subsequently designed. From the air, the 12th appears to be another two-pronged fairway par four, but don't be deceived. On the left is the seventh hole, headed in the opposite direction. The two fairways are separated by a diagonal ridge line of four deeply recessed bunkers framing the left side. Hit into any of these and you won't see the green for the next shot. Yet you must challenge these bunkers off the tee because the fairway kicks rather emphatically from left to right, pushing shots into the bunkers that line the right and leaving a disturbing angle for the approach shot. The green is convex and slopes back to front effectively reducing its size and making approach shots more difficult to keep on the putting surface.
McDonald considered the par 3 11th at the old course to be the best golf hole in the world, so naturally he wanted to improve upon it. His Eden captured the essentials, a perched green canted towards two iconic traps, the long, thin hill bunker at the left front corner and the deep, nasty strath bunker center right. There is no River Eden behind this green, but there is a river of sand. McDonald had one problem with the original. Should one's opponent be over the green into the Eden River, he wrote, one may use a putter from the tee and be sure of a four and a likely win. McDonald utilized a pond in front of the tee on his version to prevent just that. The short dogleg right 14th was originally called Cape because its green was a peninsula poking into Bullhead Bay. But when Seth Rayner was commissioned to build a causeway along the bay to accommodate a road leading to the new clubhouse, he had to encroach upon the 14th green. So McDonald built a new green a bit inland and surrounded it with sand. The tee shot strategy on 14 had always been to hug the water's edge on the right to avoid fairway undulations on the left. That strategy became the new meaning of a cape hole, to bite off what you dare over a water hazard. Of all McDonald's designs, cape is solely of his making and has been the one most often imitated by course architects over the past hundred years, but very few feature a peninsula green. Inspired by the second shot at the 15th at Muirfield, Nationals 15th is the most ambitiously bunkered hole on the course. Each bunker is a unique shape and at a different elevation, with one placed high on a hillside to the left counterbalanced by others in depressions down the right. A groaning bunker in the center of the fairway, some 50 yards short of the green, was originally meant as a carry target for approach shots. Today, however, this is in play off the tee for longer hitters. The green is large, but has a significant cant. Any approach to a back pin that is short will collect all the way to the front apron. Approaches that run over the green are almost certain to require three more shots to hole out. Sixteen is called punch bowl because of its three earthen hollows. The first two are left and right sunken portions of the very wide fairway. Both fairway punch bowls are hidden from the tee, and any drive that rolls to the bottom of either results in a blind second shot. In theory, the strategy is to drive it down the narrow center line of the hole, but this is rarely successful. The third punch bowl is the green, tucked behind a high ridge of bunkers with only a tall directional flagpole indicating its location. The hidden concave green is surprisingly small but forgiving and will feed shots down towards the flag, even those that barely clear the bunkers 30 yards short of the putting surface. If any hole encapsulates McDonald's total vision of ideal golf, it's the downhill par 4 17th. There's the breathtaking panoramic vista of Sabana Creek on the right and Great Peconic Bay on the left, with a serpentine-shaped fairway beyond a wasteland that tempts players to carry it. The heroic route is down the left side to position a short, unobstructed second shot, but not too far left as to find the bunker. The safer route is off to the right, avoiding the fairway bunkers, but leaving a longer, blind second shot. The gently undulating peninsula green is surrounded by sand. Beyond it is the club's stately entrance with four stone pillars and gates with a plaque bearing a single word, McDonald. The home hole at National Golf Links is uphill the entire way, an invigorating climb along another serpentine fairway. The daring route is directly over a pair of bunkers on the left to the widest stretch of fairway, leaving the perfect angle with which to reach this par five green in two. A drive right to avoid the bunkers leaves a challenging second shot along the bluff's edge. Anything right of the flagpole, a hundred yards short of the green is doomed. One could hit it far left on the second shot, but that brings into play one last collection of McDonald's deep face bunkers. The long and tapering 18th green is heavily guarded on the right and back by a cliff and string of narrow bunkers and on the left by a lengthy runoff. The miss on this approach is an obvious one. Since its unveiling in 1911, the layout of National Golf Links has been examined by countless generations of golf course designers. It is the textbook on strategic design and perhaps has influenced more courses in this country than any other and has been ranked by Golf Digest amongst the 100 greatest golf courses in America for over 35 years now firmly entrenched in its top 10. 
C.B. McDonald did only a handful of other course designs before his death in 1939, and never accepted a design fee for any of them. In 2007, he was inducted into the World Golf Hall of Fame, his groundbreaking architecture of National Golf Links a large reason for the honor. Restored and preserved, National is a living reminder of McDonald's overriding design philosophy that the best golf involves choices and consequences.